People of the internet, welcome to the new edition, now with bandwidth. Or once again with bandwidth, I should say. Um, so I have a, a few updates regarding the channel for you. The first thing is that I got this nice friendly letter from my provider that tells me that they finally have performed the bandwidth upgrade and so I hope you can enjoy the, the stream now in better quality. And so far I have zero dropped frames. That is amazing. Amazing enough that I have disabled the setup disclaimer that I, I've, I had been using so far. The problem is by now I got so used to the huge font size that I would probably be missing it if I switch back. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is that I put some work in my Twitch page, so now there are some description panels that you can find um, below the stream. So there is a bit of inf info about me and uh, about my YouTube channel and about the tools I use. And then there is um, the beginnings of an FAQ to cover some of the, some of the, question, the questions that already uh, came up. And there's a short section describing <clears throat> some of my, my thoughts that led to the current coding style I'm using. If you, if you watched earlier streams, you know that my coding style is a bit unusual for C++. So I'm uh, using a, a coding style that almost looks like pure C. And here I give some of the reasons why I'm doing this and why I'm experimenting with this style. So that's some, that's the news. Yeah, I wanted to give some news about the plant stream schedule, but that is still, I'm still undecided on that. So um, I would like to establish a, a regular schedule, but I don't know yet when there will be a good time for me and also for the audience. So I'm still undecided about that. Okay, and then first, let's celebrate the new bandwidth with this nice non-alcoholic beverage. Cheers. Mm. That's good. Today I was not not feeling like doing coat and beer, so today we have this um, strange non-alcoholic drink that tastes a little bit like beer. Um, yeah, the first topic I want to go into is um, I want to expand a bit on the forensics we did on the malloc memory allocator in a previous stream because I think <clears throat> I didn't really do it uh, justice. And so let's take a look at what we were doing with it. So I created a little micro benchmark that calls uh, the memory allocator many, many times. And we are gathering data, statistical data, about the, the time it takes uh, for a single malloc call, and also about the return value, so about properties of the pointer that is returned. And I was showing in a previous stream how you can use this data, even if you don't have the source code of the memory allocator, to infer some things about the implementation of the memory allocator. So 
So let's set it up once again that we actually call malloc, okay, and we will allocate a single byte. <clears throat> and let's print all of the histograms. I hope they will fit in the scrollback buffer that is much too slow of the command line. And let's see what we get. I have to switch to release to make my uh, profiling somewhat meaningful. We will later also do the debug build to show that um, malloc behaves very differently in a debug build. Let me also bring the chat window to the top. So in case you have any questions, just drop them in the chat and I will try to address whatever you want to know. We got some histograms. Oh, <laughs> I forgot how large one of the histograms is. It's too large for the scrollback buffer. So let, let us make this histogram a little smaller. It's the histogram about the low bits. Uh, let's make this smaller. And let's only look at the, at the lowest eight bits of the pointer that we get. So we will be looking at three things. One is the number of cycles it takes to execute the malloc call. One is the difference of the pointers returned from one call to the next. And the third one is the lower bits of the pointers returned. And for all of these things, we will get um, nice histograms. Oh, it still doesn't fit in the buffer. But let's look first at the low bits. So it's very clear that the low bits are not uniformly distributed. We see that uh, we only get values that are divisible by 16, which is <clears throat> not surprising because first, uh, we may have alignment um, requirements or at least benefits due to alignment. So most memory allocators will have some alignment that is at least eight bytes or, or maybe 16 bytes. And the second thing is uh, we get, even if we only allocate one byte on the heap, as I explained in, a, in one of the previous streams, actually more bytes are used up on the heap because the heap allocator has a certain overhead uh, because it needs to store the size of the block that you allocate and also it has a certain minimum size that it needs for each heap memory block because it needs to build a free list when you give it, uh, when you call free and you give the memory back to the allocator uh, typically what the allocators do is they build a chained a single uh, single linked list of the free blocks and this list is directly inside the blocks typically and so you need uh, a size and a pointer for that which uh, makes uh, 16 bytes in in this case for for the x64 uh, architecture um, last time we also looked at more of the of the lower bits or so at the lower 12 bits or something or even i think at the lower 16 or so and we didn't really see a pattern there apart from the the 16 byte alignment that we see here and this also tells me something it is a hint that um, the the heap allocator um, 
does not put housekeeping information about the larger memory blocks that it uh, gets from the system, it does not put this housekeeping information uh, inside these memory blocks, but it keeps this information on the side. Because otherwise I would expect that we would see some, some pattern in the lower bits that we do not, that we do never get, we would never get pointers pointing at the beginning of one of these blocks. And so this would be noticeable, I think. So uh, we are not really, we are not really seeing something like that. So either there is no such pattern because the info is somewhere on the side or the pattern is very small and we couldn't notice it. So let's disable this very large histogram that screws up our screw back buffer. Sorry, I want this window. And let's look at the other stats. First runtime, <clears throat> uh, we see that um, the median time it takes for a malloc call is in the release build is about 100 cycles, which sounds reasonable. And we see a slight secondary peak at about 269 cycles. So this might be something due to cache misses, misses, for example, that you have about a bit more than 100 cycles delay or something. Uh, la the last time we did this, we also identified further peaks that I will not go into here. I will just quickly mention them. So we noticed that uh, every about 3,000th time, um, malloc takes about 20 times longer or 20 to 40 times longer. And this is, I think, because um, it works in, in 32 kilobyte blocks. So if you calculate things, it, it, this would match 32 kilobyte blocks. Um, and within a block, it is very fast. It immediately returns basically the, uh, a new pointer. And if the block runs out, it has to get a new block and this takes some time. And then, um, about every 64 kilobytes, we have a much longer uh, time for memory allocation, about 100,000 cycles. And there I would suspect that the memory allocator is actually doing some kind of system call to get new uh, memory allocated from the operating system, for example. So these, these are my assumptions. And today we will try to confirm them by looking at the source code of, of malloc if we can find it. So that's the runtime. And this 100 cycles is, is something that I, I want to stay close to when we go to a custom memory allocator that we will discuss later. I mean, which at the beginning will only be a wrapper around malloc with some edit debug and logging functionality. So the second histogram um, is the, the pointer differences. Okay, they are currently they are quite uninteresting, we see that most of the pointer differences are very small. And then we have a tiny peak at about, yeah, s slightly below 32K. This is another hint that we are dealing with 32K blocks of memory somewhere in the, inside the memory allocator. Um, I want to show you a case where this histogram of the pointer differences is much more interesting because currently it will typically or, or almost always be just an increment of 16 bytes. And actually it almost always is this increment of 16 bytes. So even at the block boundaries, we typically get a new block that is directly adjacent to the old one. So not much to see here. But let's do something more fun. Let's switch sizes between uh, so let's alternate between allocating two different sizes and we will first let's try one byte and nine bytes. <clears throat> nine bytes 
is the first size for which we should get more than 16 bytes consumed. So we should get uh, either 24 or 32 bytes consumed if we actually request 9 bytes from the heap. So let's see what this gets us. <clears throat> so first thing is speed is almost the same. It's maybe a bit slower, but um, we shouldn't. We should be careful about very small differences here because, especially while OBS is running, uh, benchmarking can be a bit um, can be a bit shaky and. Now we see a very interesting histogram for the pointer differences. So we see that pointer differences are concentrated around two values that are, we see here, uh, plus 32k and minus 32k. And if you think about it, the reason is quite clear. The allocator, as memory allocators are, are wont to do, is using so-called size pools, so it is pooling all of the allocations of a certain size in one block and the allocations are giving a different size in a different block. And the purpose of this is to um, decrease heap fragmentation because the problem is if you allocate blocks of different sizes and then you freeze some of them, you get a heap that looks like a Swiss cheese with a lot of holes in it and all the holes have different sizes. And so if you, if you want to allocate new memory, it is quite likely that you won't fit, um, won't find a hole of the, of the correct size. And so the, the heap will grow more than necessary because you have these, this, these sizes of variable holes, uh, this, this holes of variable sizes that you cannot reuse efficiently. And so the memory, allocator tries to use one block, for example, only for the 16 byte um, block allocations, because if it frees some of them, it can easily fit other 16 byte uh, allocations into the holes and um, same for the other sizes. So typically what allocators will do is just for, for a list of small sizes, they will have one pool for each size. And then for the larger sizes, they will start to mix different sized allocations. And these ramps, of course, are because we are alternating between sizes. So one of the pointers runs faster than the other because it uses more memory. And let's try to mitigate that uh, by trying to guess what we have to do in order to use up memory with the same speed. So let's say this takes 16 bytes each time and this takes 32. I'm not sure if it is 32 or 24. I think it was 32. Um, so we should do the smaller size twice as often. Let's try that. So let's calculate module three. And if it is non-zero, we do the one byte, otherwise we do the nine bytes. Let's see if this gives us a different pattern. Which maybe will give us a clearer picture of the, of the size pools. And I think it does. Let's take a look. So, We have a huge peak at zero. No, actually it doesn't. It, this destroyed the pattern. So maybe I was wrong about the 32. Uh, let's see. If one is uses up 16 bytes and the under, other 24. So the lowest common denominator will be 48, I think, right? 
So we should do this, the small one three times and the other two times. Let's try that. So if iteration counter modulo five is, is smaller than smaller than three, do the small one, otherwise do the large one. Let's see. If this is not, not, not successful, we will move on because I think this is not the most interesting aspect about the memory allocator that we can look at. Okay, now we at least we see some secondary peaks at 32K, but I'm still missing something because the peaks are somehow very broad. I mean, maybe it is just that this peak, because, because now, now we, we record all the pointer differences, not only those where we are switching the, switching the size. Let's try this as, as, the, as the last thing to only record, to only record uh, if we are switching the size. So uh, let's remember the size here. So previous size, we will remember the previous size. We will calculate the size every time. And here we will only record the pointer difference if the size is not the same as the previous size. Okay, we again see clearer peaks at 32K. I'm still missing something in this picture. So let's maybe go back to where we tried the two to one ratio. And let's see what we get. Okay, we see <clears throat> we see a ramp again. It goes up to 64k. So it seems we, we somehow destroyed the pattern, but we still see some block structure because we don't get differences that are larger than that. It could also be, as, I, as, as we noticed the last time we did that, that maybe, maybe actually for the larger, okay, here I wrote it down actually, we get 32 bytes, so no wonder that this doesn't work. And we might actually be dealing with 64K blocks for the larger sizes, not 32, so yeah. So, so this, this does not make a lot of sense. This does make more sense. Uh, sorry, no. No, this is the, this should be the right one. So, does twice 16 bytes and then 32, okay. But <clears throat> we don't, we don't see the nice pattern that we see with alternating the size. But anyway, this is, um, for us, it's for now good enough that we see that there is some size pooling definitely going on. Otherwise, we wouldn't see these two large uh, peaks around 32K when we alternate sizes. So this is the pointer differences that we see. 
Okay, the next thing I want to try is if we can actually find the source code of malloc and see if, if our suspicions were actually justified. So what I did is I disabled a very annoying feature in uh, Visual Studio. If you, um, if you check your debug options, there is this feature just, that is called just my code. I mean, if features are called like that, you immediately know that they are probably no good and just annoying you. And I disabled this feature because I sometimes I also want to see the, the runtime library code and so on. I don't want to see just my code because it doesn't exist in a vacuum. So that is a bit... I mean, maybe it helps sometimes, especially in, in if you if you work with the standard template library or something and you you are stepping through, maybe this feature makes sense, but for me it doesn't. So let's break it malloc. And let's try to step into it with which... Okay, we forgot we want to do... Oh, let's, let's just do that. Still, ah, I still have this, this thing, these things in that weren't too successful anyway. So let's get rid of them. Okay, <laughs> I left my breakpoint at the command, which was stupid because the command is of course not creating any, not generating any code that I can break on. Okay, now I'm confused because the breakpoint was definitely at the right, at the right line. Why? Okay, it's warning about something. The breakpoint will not currently be hit. Is it optimized away or something? Yeah, we, we might get problems due to this being the release build. Let's first try the profile build, which is release but with debug info. It should make it easier for the debugger to set a correct breakpoint. And if this doesn't work, we will go to the debug build where nothing has been optimized away. Of course, in the debug build, we might see a very different code path. Then, yeah, now the breakpoint is working. Uh, let's do a step and see where we, okay. We immediately didn't do a machine step. Can I? Probably I must go directly to the disassembly. So let's see if we can step, yeah, we can step instructions here and then we can step directly into the core. Okay, this is an indirect call getting its address from this imp malloc thing, it seems. Okay, we have a kind of trampoline. 
and now we should be in malloc and let's see if it okay we do not get any information of the about the source file here which is what i wanted to have So let's see where we are going. Okay, we have some variable ACLT heap. That's a promising name at least, which we could also search for later. And we go to imp heap alloc. RTL allocate heap. Oh, that's that's at least a promising name. RTL allocate heap. So let's see if, if we can find that. No. Hmm. I actually don't know. Um if I actually have the, the sources that we need here. But let's first go to the debug build and see if we get a little more info. I don't have a lot of experience with Visual Studio and Visual C++, so I'm not entirely sure whether they include uh, the RTL sources in the SDK and whether they so let's see what we got okay it looks a bit different now so now we have a call to mlog debug okay now we at least get a source location absolutely heap debug heap. Uh, let's see if we, has, if, if we have something like that. CRT. Okay, we have we don't have app CRT. That is a bad sign. What is the lib now? Do we have a debug heap? No. Do we have any anything useful? at all here. What, what do we have here in this CRT? Okay, this is not source code. This is source code, CRT source. This is one we should look at the new array because this also has to do memory allocation. Nobody in, in app, uh, nobody in chat is screaming at me for being stupid, so I don't know how stupid I'm being here. So 
So let's look at this. Um, let's go to CRT source. I mean, usually CRT should should mean C runtime, right? And you would expect some. Um, some source there. So let's look at VC runtime, new array. <laughs> wow, <laughs> VC runtime new, that is not a lot. We just learned that the operator new array is just delegating to the operator new at least in, in the source that we have here that was not very enlightening we have lots of cores to malloc Okay, we have here some definitions of malloc macros. This malloc debug, we already noticed that this is used in debug, but did not find it so far. So here from not debug, we have this, this malloc base. This is also something we saw. we saw being used. So malloc base and malloc debug are the actual implementations that we would need, but we do not find them in this source code that we have here. So this is definitely not a complete source code of the CRT. So let's ask Dr. Google or Dr. Go. Microsoft. Okay, CRT source and CRT include, well, or include. Okay, it's most of the sources, great. Why would I need most of the sources? Why wouldn't I need all of the sources if you ship them? Let's see if we have something in include that is useful, but I don't expect so. No, we don't have anything. <coughs> no, nothing useful here.
Malok Pace, yeah, we know that it exists, but we know, don't know anything else about it. Okay, the standard template library seems to be online. Okay, so currently it looks to me like they don't include the sources of the memory allocator, which is too bad. So let's get on to our next topic. Um, Merck source, this was a fail so far. <clears throat> So I made some progress off stream uh, implementing the new interface for memory allocation that I talked about in a, in a previous episode. And I have already converted almost all of my PDF parser in JBIG2 code to use the new interface. And it worked mostly well. What I like very much already about the design is that by looking at the function signature you can immediately see whether the function um, may actually allocate or free or reallocate some memory because it can only do so if it gets the memory pointer so that it is the pointer to the memory manager. If it gets this pointer um, in its argument, otherwise it cannot do any allocation. So this, or I, I already, uh, it already turned out that I like this a lot because um, you immediately see in the code when you call some functions, you immediately see where you need to think about um, maybe freeing some memory later if things go downhill or so, uh, you immediately see uh, which functions are candidates for for using up some, some memory. Um, the thing that I'm most unsure about currently in the design of the memory allocator interface is that for now I chose uh, to deviate a bit from the from the interface of, of the C standard malloc, you know that you pass the size of the block you want to malloc, but you do not pass the size to free because the standard C memory allocator is expected to remember the size of the block that you allocated, which actually means that typically uh, it has to use at least in, in the 64-bit case, at least eight bytes more than you actually ask it for because it has to store the size. And now I noticed that in many, many cases in my code, I store the size anyway because I need to know how large an array is or so. And so there's actually some redundancy in that. So the size is stored once in my normal data structures and once it is stored uh, by the heap manager. And this actually wastes some, some memory and the problem is not actually wasting the memory because these are small amounts that are not, not relevant in, in today's computers, but there's, um, there's one thing that is very relevant in today's computers and that is how, val how, how um, well you use the cache of the, of the CPU the caches and uh, the, the first level caches are quite small so they would typically have sizes of 32 kilobytes for example and they are organized in lines of 64 bytes 
And within these 64 bytes, you have exactly that layout that you put uh, in, in your program because they just use the lower uh, six bits uh, to um, identify bytes in the 64 byte cache line. And the CPU does not reorganize or associate anything on this smaller scale that is smaller than the cache line. And <clears throat> so one thing that you should think about if you lay out your data structures is that you that you block all the hot data so the data that is often accessed you block all the hot data together so you need the minimum amount of cache lines for your hot data if you if you mix hot and cold data so data that is often used and data that is rarely used if you mix them at the small scale then you have the problem that uh, within each cache line you will have some hot data but also some cold data that you actually almost never use and so you will waste uh, cache memory and that's that's the thing to think about here so not that you of the eight gigabyte that you have in it that, that you will um, waste some of that that's not so relevant uh, what is much more relevant is uh, which part of the cache lines you are wasting by putting cold data next to hot data. Uh, and that is also something that I wanted to talk about because I made this convenience template for keeping arrays, which actually worked out to be quite convenient. Uh, it's, it's a bit similar to what uh, a standard vector in the STL would do. So you have a pointer to an array and then you have um, a counter of how many entries are used in the array and how many entries are actually allocated so you know when to grow the array and so on. And these are actually um, put in a struct next to each other and this is very convenient. However, you want to think about um, is this actually um, how I want to lay out data in memory? Because it could be that for example the array pointer is very hot so it's used a lot and it might be that, for example, the counters, how large the array is, are almost never used. And so this would be a typical case where you have here eight bytes that are hot and then you have eight bytes that are cold directly next to each other and they would go into the same cache line. So that's something that um, is a downside of this, of, of making these, these small convenient um, structs. And so I decided in, in the interface of my memory allocator that I actually would like to have both options. So sometimes for convenience, I want to use uh, such a template uh, struct that uh, actually makes my life easier when I build up code that uses, uses arrays. And so I have some, um, I have some macros that make use of this kind of, um, of array structure. So this memory alloc array 32 macros and so on. But I also have some, I also have some macros, I currently call them custom, which I'm not so happy with, where I can um, specify the variables separately. So I can specify this is the pointer to the array and this is the um, the counter, how many elements are allocated, and they can be at very different places. Um, yeah, so that's that's one thing I, I added off stream. So most of the code is converted. I still have a single free call still inside there that I where I have exactly the problem that I know I want to free something but I don't know its size and as I decided for now to to make my interface in such a way that the free call needs also the size because the memory allocator is not required to to remember it by itself I I need to restructure my code in some places I mean I think that I'm still a bit unsure about this decision, but I think it will work out that in the end, when I'm, I get used to it and I, um, 
I will actually not have any problem with that because I keep sizes for the things that I use around anyway, uh, typically. And I just ha then have um, some freedom where to put the size information. It's not always at the beginning of the block like the heap allocator would, would put it normally. Um. <clears throat> okay. So I implemented also these, of course, these functions. So the, the tests are actually already using them. And so far they're simply wrappers around uh, the, the standard C library malloc and, and free calls. I have the, the, the possibility to uh, create a, a, a simple log of all the memory allocation calls so far. So this will become much more sophisticated in the future. And now what I want to do is actually a very simple thing. I just want to build in a, a variable that counts the, the number of bytes allocated on the heap. And we will use it to detect some memory leaks. So to, make, to get the first, um, the first benefit from our custom uh, memory allocation functions here. We will do it in the most simple way. So we will just put this counter into the memory struct. And let's just call it number of bytes allocated. And actually, um, I'm thinking of calling it something like the payload because uh, these, this count should not include any overhead. So this should really be the, the number of bytes that we request from, from this memory allocator. So at the beginning, we will set this um, to zero. And then very simple in memory log. So if memory log succeeds, we will increment this by the size we allocated. Uh, when we free, we need to be a bit careful because I want to have my free, my free call, I want to have the same um, property as the standard C library that if the pointer is already null, it shouldn't do anything. So um, we will, only if the pointer is non-zero, we will actually do something. And then we will, <clears throat> now it's easy for us because we get past the size. So we will decrement the size. And this will be one of the first checks. There will be late, more checks later. Uh, in the deeper build, we will check whether the, the sizes passed to the free calls are consistent with the ones uh, that are passed to allocate and reallocate calls. So the allocate array function is very similar. So here also in the, in the success case, We have this. Uh, the reallocate case is here. So um, we can also have a failure in which the number of allocated bytes does not change. But if we have the success, uh, then the number changes. And in this case, We actually should first, let's do it in a, in a simple but stupid way. So first we subtract the old size, which is uh, uh, 
the old size is number allocated times element size. And the new size is now the new and allocated times element size. So that's a bit awkward, but it will do the job. Um, for free, again, same story. Actually, this was, was buggy so far because I used the, the pointer without checking whether it's null. So only if I have a non zero pointer, we will actually delegate to free and we will free in this case. Okay, we have to do it before we set the n allocated to zero and allocated times element size. I think we actually should make the element size here a 32-bit um, variable. So we know that we won't have any overflow in the multiplication automatically. And I don't plan on having element sizes in arrays that are larger than 32-bit. So let's make a note here. Change element size to uint 32. Okay, and with this, I think we have everything we need to start checking for leaks. So let's pick one of our test cases. And there will be lots of leaks for sure currently. I actually <laughs> put a marker for myself to remember that I have a leak in this case, for example. So let us, um, so here we, we initialize the memory manager. And in this case, we should be um, able to check it very easily. So <clears throat> at the end, the number of bytes allocated should be zero again. And let's see if, if that actually is the case. It should not be the case because we have a leak here, actually. So we are in the debug build and we want to test JBIG2. Let's delete all the breakpoints and run. I really wonder how, how this compiler can be so slow. It's amazing. The files I'm compiling are so small so far. Okay, we have a fail, which is what we expect. And it is because payload allocated is 44 bytes and should be zero. So we definitely have identified a memory leak as expected. So let's see if we can uh, get rid of this leak because what, we, what is happening here is that parse segment header is a function that takes the memory manager because it can allocate a segment header and it actually does so and we never free the header. So let's hopefully fix this by calling here free. Do we have, yeah, we have a function free segment header. Uh, let's check its signature. Okay, it's already a nice one. This is another thing, another policy I want to have in my code is that all the freeing functions can never fail. So that's why they do not have the status uh, parameter. The status parameter is what I use in my code base for propagating error information. So uh, the status object contains 
the information whether there has been any error and if so it contains the error message and if a function does not have this status pointer as the first argument we actually know immediately it can never fail it has no path to failure and that's fine for a free I actually want all my freeing functions in this way because it really um, it really is annoying if you if you have error conditions that can arise during freeing of memory because freeing of memory is a typical thing that you need to do in your error handling and so then you have the problem that you have possible errors raised during your error handling which is usually something that software cannot deal with in a very graceful way so I have a nice example <laughs> that, I, that I got when using PowerShell. <laughs> that was a particularly funny one. It said, unhandled exception cannot print exception string because exception to string failed. That's exactly one of these cases where you have an error happening during error handling and this always gets, turns into a mess. Okay, so let's free the segment header and let's see if this fixes our leak. Um, yes. It fixed the leak. Very nice. And now we will just go through our unit test and add this line at the end. Uh, at least at, at the end of all of them that, that use the memory manager. So here we also expect the header to leak. So we will also, so let's put this in a register. Uh, we will also free the segment header here and the leak should be fixed. Now we have this interesting example that does a lot of things. So here I expect a lot more memory to leak. I already have some free cores, but I also made a note for myself that I expect further leaks from this code. Uh, let me actually check if I can remove this old code here. I think, yes, I can remove this code. Um, and one second. Okay, um, I'm back. So I'm expecting some leaks here. Uh, let's see how much we actually leak. Well, let, let's also put this in other in other tests that use the memory manager. Let's just. Grab for the for the memory manager. That was the wrong key, but shouldn't matter. We actually want to test JBIG two. What what is this software thinking all the time? It it's it's using seconds and seconds and seconds. It's amazing. See, building CMake projects. I, I sometimes wonder, do, do the, the people who make this kind of software, this Visual Studio and all of this stuff, do they have any idea what a modern computer can do in five seconds?
Yeah, so we see that we are leaking 312 bytes of memory in this example. And let's see where, where they are coming from. Okay, and now we will now we will actually implement because we I mean we could try to uh, try to analyze it by looking at the code, but we will we will actually now do something that I think will be very useful is um, we will make our memory allocator build a list of build a list of the blocks we have already we have actually allocated and make it describe these blocks to us at the end so we actually see exactly uh, what we are leaking so how we will how will we go about that like that uh, we need a data structure to keep this information <clears throat> um, and I think I will put this in a, in, in a nested namespace because this is actually something I think this is something we, we will only want in debug so we'll make a nested debug namespace to highlight for myself that this is about debugging functionality and we will um, we will define some data structures to keep this information and let's call it um, should we call it block info or something So what do we need? Uh, we probably want to have the pointer, the pointer to the block. Uh, we definitely want want to have the size of the block. Uh, we want to store the the description of the block. Um, we want you to add a character here. My normally my convention is that I use character point of or character arrays for zero terminated stuff, and this will be zero terminated strings. So let's have a character array description. We will. Um, to keep things simple, uh, we will give give it a fixed size. We will take care to uh, not duplicate this size information anywhere else. So this will only be defined here. How many bytes we reserve for the prediction uh, for the description? Do we need anything else? Um, the question is, will we put the location information, so like file and line, into the description or not? I think I want to keep it separately. The question is just how many bytes to reserve for file. I mean, later we can make this all variable sized if we think that it's it matters to optimize here for the average case and not for the to to size out everything for the worst case. Um, but for now, I think I will just make it very simple and and straightforward and have these things fixed sizes. So we will have a file name. I don't want to make this too insanely large. 
um, we will have on it, we will have a line number and that's it for now I mean we can add things later like the um, type information that we also have and so on so this is the block info now we need to think about um, where we will actually store these blocks so I think I, I do not want to have them mixed into the heap I want them separately on the side and the question is uh, we will, I think we will probably do some kind of hash table for these structures and let's call it block block info table it will have one of these um, very useful arrays so an array of block info that constitutes the actual actual table this also includes then the, the used and the allocated count and yeah and I think later I will want to move this from the header into the implementation file, maybe, maybe not, because I, I'm not sure if I want um, accessing these structures. So we will have this block info table here. Um, Okay, I'm just thinking if maybe I want to make it, I think at the beginning I, don't, I will not even implement a hash table, table, we will just do a linear search for the first version. Because this is only for debugging anyway, so it doesn't need to be too fast, sorry. Yeah, so now the one thing I'm thinking about now is can we actually use our own, the problem is we cannot really use our own, our own memory that would be so convenient to use our own allocation functions because they are so nice but the problem is then we then we get a, a kind of recursion problem and we do not really want to mix uh, this data into the ones that is allocated by user code so let's do it by hand um, So number used is zero, number allocated is one, which we will tune later. And the array is um, So okay, this is the point where I think I will go to a somewhat smaller font size. Let's see, maybe something like this. I hope you can still see well with the new bandwidth. By the way, let's check if we have some dropped frames. No dropped, eight dropped frames. Okay, that's 
I can live with that. Um, I'm noticing that my CPU is, is working noticeably harder uh, now that I have the higher bandwidth. So that could become a, a minor problem. So right now that I have to do this by hand, I actually notice how convenient my new memory location functions are. I think I forgot the namespace here, so... <clears throat> okay, then we will make ourselves some helper functions in the implementation namespace for looking up block infos uh, and yeah, looking up block infos, adding block infos and removing block infos. Actually, we should I will put this in also here in a, in a debug namespace. And when we add block info, we will pass it the pointer, the size. And um, okay, the description will be an interesting problem. Let's first put file and line because that we have directly from, and then we will put um, a format string and a VA list for the variable arguments, as you will see. Okay, so that add block info. Um, now we actually need to maybe grow our table array. So first let's assert, actually here I need, of course, the memory manager. First, let's assert that used is at most the number allocated. It's a bit of a pity that I'm now, I'm, I'm basically re-implementing what I already have in the, in the growing, in the array growing function, so here. So let's maybe copy this and reuse it here. That's a bit of a pity because we cannot really reuse the function um, that is used by the user code. So and allocated times two. This is our very primitive growing plan that we have. We just double each time. size times element size and element size is size of block info uh, reallocating As this is debug functionality, we don't need too much info here. 
uh, okay actually we have this no um, let's just as this is debug stuff let us just abort in this case There's no sense in, in continuing here in this and doing error handling in this debug helper code. This we do not need memory. Sorry, locking for table dot array is the new buffer now. Uh, we will need to cast this. And man block info array dot n allocated is the new size. And we need to do this only if all of the entries are actually used already. Then we need to do the growing. Now uh, we can take um, we can take a pointer and we can actually increment increment the used. Um, Okay, we will later, we will return this pointer to the block. And now let's fill out the structure. So the gets the pointer. It gets the size. Um, it gets the line info, that's no problem. And now we just need to be careful not to overrun our fixed size stuff. So we will make a a string n copy to block info file name from file and we will limit this to size of block info file name and uh, let's quickly i never remember the exact semantics of these functions Okay, that's actually not the one I wanted to have. This is, I think, the one. String and copy. Return value. Destination is returned, which is totally useless. Um, No, this is what I wanted to know. Yeah, there is no no null character appended at the end. Um, which is um, also a way we can detect the overflow case. So if if the last byte, which is um, This one, if this is not zero, we know that we have an, we had an overflow. Um, and in this in this case, we will do the following. Uh, I I will later 
re uh, refactor this into a helper because this is something I might do several times. So minus one is the terminating zero. I want to put three dots before that. So I want to have minus five. Uh, sorry, minus four. So we can now copy four characters. We copy three dots and the terminating zero. That will be our marker that we, we overflowed the file name length. So we have the three dots at the end. Maybe we should, maybe to make this more visible, let's actually do, do that. One, two, three, four, five, and the terminating zero. And to be completely clean, let's assert that this is a same size, so it is at least six bytes long. Um, this we should actually make a static assert, which is this already Let's see if this is already supported in this version. Um, so we get it already checked at compile time, which makes more sense in this case. Okay, so we have the file name stored. Now let's do something similar with the, the, the debug info, which can actually be, which is a format string plus a variable number of arguments. So we need a VSN print F. We print to block info description. Uh, which has a certain size. And we print format and the VA list. And this, I think this is a more useful return value. So VSN print F. Um, the remaining characters are so this kind of If it is non negative and less than n, then the string has been written. So, uh, first we will assert that written is not negative because we do not expect any errors here. And this is debug code, so we just assert that no errors happen. So, if written is smaller than the size of the what we have available, then everything is actually fine. If it is greater than or equal, then we know we had something like here, we had an over, we would have had an overflow, but we actually were careful. So let's um, put a marker at the end so we notice that we have this kind of problem. Okay, uh, do we have anything else to put in the block? No. Um, then we need, we need something that can actually print the information that we uh, stored here. So let's make a print block info table. to a file. I, in, in such functions, I always 
include um, an indent that I put at the beginning of each line, which is very useful if you want to have some logging prefix that you that you put before each line. So let's first print. Um, number of blocks allocated uh, let's call it number of heap blocks And then let's just go over the table. For now, we will just do it very stupidly with uh, the for loop. I actually plan to make a more nice for loop using iterators work on, on these types of arrays, but this is not yet, not yet in place. Sorry, I'm typing too many garbage things here. Um, I forgot the indent. <clears throat> so we want to need, we want to know the pointer. Uh, we want to know the size. Uh, we want to know the file name. We want to know the line number. Um, and we want to know the description. So indent. Block info. Let's use a short name. Pointer size file line description. Okay. And this is something that we actually want to be able to do from a unit test. So we put it here into the header. Uh, let's see that we have standard IO here for the file pointer. And The next thing we need to do is to actually call the adding function. Let's also put this in the header so we um, have no problem with referring to it in the code above. And whenever we allocate, we will, whenever we allocate successfully, We will call this function so mem pointer size file line format and the VA list and the VA list we actually need to start here again start and end it This should be it, and this we do in all the memory allocation calls. In the growing call, we should actually look it up and update it, but this we will do later. So, okay, and now we will 
in the unit test where we have the, the leak, we will actually um, let it print what we have in memory. So let's see if something compiles. Probably we have some compile errors. Yes. So let's first fix the compile errors. Yeah, of course, this is debug add info. Okay, here we need dot table dot used. Okay, that's a bigger change. So let's do it in Vim. So table dot. Yes. 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 I forgot this everywhere. So we don't have string n copy because we have not included C string. We cannot convert from size t to, ah, okay. <clears throat> the standard library is so inconsistent in where it puts the sizes of things. Okay, so this puts the size actually at the end. String and copy. while the, the VSN printf puts its second place. So <laughs> that's not very consistent. Okay, the static assert is not yet, uh, this needs the C++ 17 standard, which we actually could, could use but for now, let's just make it a regular assert. But I want to have static asserts later because static asserts are the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah, this is something I, we know that this fun, how to use this function. At, at least I almost know how to use this function. I think it works like this. This is actually called file name. Okay, we have some messed up. We have indent pointer size file line description. Looks good, but we made we did something wrong. Print a file. Oh, no, it's fine. What is with argument four? Variadic argument four. One, two, three, four. 
how does it call the variagic arguments? Uh, how does it count them? What is going on? The S is the indent, the P is the pointer, the pr print with the sign. S is the final one. People, I am being blind. What am I missing here? Six. One, two, three, four, five, six. But five were provided. Also. One, two, three, four, five, six. What are you talking about? What are you talking about here? Is this not working? Ah, yeah. Probably, probably this is not working because for this you need to include C int types, I think. Yes, that's it. Now what we should see if things compile is a list of heap blocks that we allocated. And we get it here. We have three things on the heap. We have a Huffman decoding table, a long Huffman prefix array and a fast Huffman decoding Look up table. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh. Yes, it is Windows 7 and that is even in the FAQ because it seems to fascinate people so much that I'm using <laughs> Windows 7. Uh, the, the reason is that I, um, I have a rule that I never update the oper anymore the operating system on a machine. So I have one machine with one operating system and I use it as long as I use the machine. No, I mean updates, yes, as long as I get them, but no upgrades. And I have been burned too often by OS upgrades. No longer, I'm not playing along. So, now I should see, I should, I should see chat again. Okay, let's see what we have here. We have three, actually, I think I added it, this, this debug print to the wrong test because I mean, it's working, so that's fine. But it's not the interesting case that we have here. The interesting case is this one. So, let's see the printout we get here. Yeah, we get lots of blocks 
Look what we have, have on the heap. Lots of stuff. A JBIG2 segment collection, a JBIG2 segment, a symbol array, a symbol hit class array, a symbol dictionary, collective hit class bitmap, and so on. So we see already that we have lots of stuff on the heap. Um, most of this should, or I don't know if most of it, but um, part of this should actually be freed already at the time we print this, which we will soon see when we actually remove the info blocks for the blocks be free, and then we should see what we are actually leaking. But at least uh, the listing is already working. So let's do the next step. Whenever we free a block, we need to remove the debug info for the block from this table. So let's build a function that does this for us. And that also checks the consistency um, of the sizes. So when we make a function, check and remove block info. Um, we will have pointer and size and nothing else. So this function will be simpler than the previous one. <clears throat> so this is all pretty fascinating stuff. That is nice to hear that you find it interesting. If you have any specific questions, just drop them in the chat and I will address them. So <clears throat> the first thing we, we will do is just a very stupid linear table search. Later, so probably not today, we will make this data structure actually fast and efficient, but for now we will just do the most simple thing that comes to mind. So we run over the table, and if the pointer is exactly matching, we have found the block to remove. So now we will check the consistency of the size. Um, and this actually might fail when we run it, because for the reallocation we do not yet update the size information. So let's see. Uh, let's check the sizes. If size is, or let's do it the other way, if um, the size we remember is not the size we get passed. Is not, not is, is not. Um, then we will print an error message to standard error. <clears throat> and we will say, um, we will say error inconsistent size um, for for sizes uh, we will also print the block info so where the block is um, print all the information that we have and we will also print things like the file info for this block, the line info for this block, the description of this block. This all should help a lot in debugging if we get a real problem. So the pointer we know is the same, then the bi size the size, the bi file name, the bi line, the bi 
description. Uh, let's be careful and flush standard error, which should be done anyway, I think, but then we abort. So let's be sure to flush it before that. Okay, so now we know after checking this that the sizes are consistent. So we will just remove this block. And this is very simple because we just need to do a mem. Actually, we do a mem move because the mem move supports overlapping uh, destination and source. So we just shift the remainder of the array one block to the front to clear out this block. And the only thing we need to calculate is how many how many block infos do we need to copy? This is the number of used entries minus the current the current index minus one should be the right thing to do. So if i is zero, this is n used minus one, which is the new n used. That's fine. And n used is at least one. I mean this we know that, but uh, again I forget I forgot the table here. Times size of block info. And then we simply need to decrement the count of used blocks. That is a very simple linear search and remove operation. And then we return. Um, if we actually ever get here, we did not find we did not find the block, which is also an error. So let's um, write um, unknown heap block. We of course cannot really give any information now. Actually, what we could do, we should have for the freeing, we should have also file and line information for the freeing. This we can say, we can say where the free happens that doesn't match. That's actually interesting. So we have file and line information here. And we can also, wow, this will be a long error message. Let's break it up a bit. So we have file and line description. We have the free file where the free is actually called. We have the free line number. Um, so that is file and line. And these we can also print here. Free file. Um, free, I don't, don't use commas above, so let's not use them here. Uh, we have the pointer. We have the file. Sorry for typing so badly. We have file and line. Okay, and now whenever we free something and we actually do it. We will call debug check and remove block info. And I don't remember the signature. So we have mem, we have pointer, we have size, we have file, we have line. C 
same here. Uh, except here we have the pointer is here called is here what is pointed to by data. Um, the, sh the size should be element size times n allocated. And that's it. So let's try this out. It could be after fixing these um, after fixing these mistakes, so we need to put the prototype in the header. Um, could be that after fixing these mistakes, we actually get an inconsistent size because upon reallocation we do not yet update the size information. Ah, that reminds me. Something I also want to have in this debug information is information how many times a block was reallocated. Yeah, we get a problem with inconsistent sizes because we, we see that a block grew from 8 bytes to 16 bytes and we did not update this information. So. Uh, let's fix it first in a simple way. For growing the array. Let's fix it first in a simple way that we first remove the block and add it again. I mean, that's a bit stupid, but it will for now it will work. So we first remove the old pointer and the old pointer is at data. The new one is also at data after we have updated it. The old size times element size. That's, that's not so nice that we have this calculated two times here. So I might refactor this uh, file and line should be fine. And here we have also an allocated times element size file line. So let's make two notes. Uh, first is that we actually want to update the block instead of removing and adding it. And the second is um, refactor common expressions probably. But let's first check if this fixed our problem. <laughs> no, we have an abort. Or what do we have? Debug error. Uh, the variable VL is being used without being initialized. Okay. Funny that we get uh, such a dialog box for that. Um, VL because we did not probably we forgot the start VA start and VA end and they actually have built in some nice debugging functionality in the debug build that catches this it seems nice <clears throat> yeah now it's working Okay, we should now we should now get a more sensible dump of what is still lying around on the heap. Yeah, this looks this looks more sensible. And actually, um, we see that three hundred twelve bytes are leaked. And actually, the sum of these should be three hundred twelve. Uh, so let's bring up my calculator Python. 20 plus 24 plus 16 plus 40 plus 20 plus 20 48 16 72 and 36 
is 312. Perfect. So we see exactly what we are leaking. And you see, this is now this is now becoming really nice debugging information that we have here. Because it might seem like a lot of work that I did now, but you need to consider that we do this only once. And then for any unit test that we do, we can do something very simple like this, like check whether at the end, whether the number of allocated bytes is zero. And if it isn't, um, which so we should only do this if it isn't, but so we could, I mean, we can make a convenience function for that, of course, but if this is not zero, then we actually print which blocks are still on the heap. And we have a very, very nice uh, debugging functionality without using external tools like Valgrin, for example, that could give us similar information but are much more complicated to use. We have it directly in our code base. And now we can fix the leaks because, for example, we know that the JBIG2 segment header is leaking, a symbol array is leaking, and so on. So um, let's first, we also get some extra information. For example, we see that this segment header is bigger because it has two referred to segments. So we see this 36 bytes instead of 24 and so on. So very nice information. We also see exactly where it was allocated. So um, this is leaking from line 4897. So 4897, let's go to this. 4897 and exactly here, you see, we find directly the allocation call that <coughs> allocated the block that is leaking. Very nice debugging information. So let's at least plug some of the holes in our memory allocation here. We need to free the segment headers in this unit test. So this is actually not a bug of our device under test code that we are testing um, that it leaks the headers. This is a bug of our unit test, which I actually noted here that we have this bug because I knew it. <clears throat> so I think we can every time we have we have finished a segment <clears throat> we can actually free the segment header. So we can get rid of this. Um, actually what I should do always, um, I make it a habit that always when I free something, I actually then zero it because <clears throat> it's a bad habit to have pointers to freed blocks lying around. You can get problems with double free calls and so on if you do it. Okay, where, where are we done with this? So, da, 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 I think here. And then, yeah, the segment collection, I think this is still not, this will still leak somewhat. But we should now see that the segment headers should be gone from this list and we should be down from the 312 bytes leaking. Let's see what we got. Uh, 
Um, this is something I don't understand. Why is this window sometimes wider and sometimes narrower? But anyway, we see what I expected. So the JPEG2 headers are no longer reported here. <coughs> Sorry. The only things that we are still leaking are one symbol array, one symbol eight, eight class array, a symbol dictionary, collective eight class bitmap, and the same thing again for the other symbol dictionary. So um, we need to free we need to free the two symbol dictionaries and then the remaining 216 bytes that we are currently leaking should be gone. I'm not sure if... So normally this should be dealt with by the segment collection free, I think. or not depends <clears throat> currently it's not implemented so this is something i cannot easily fix now this will be some work to put in a code base to fix this <clears throat> but at least we know we know now exactly what we are leaking let's look at the other case what what are we leaking in in the other case because there was something else Uh, in another test, in the long prefixes test, we are leaking parts of a Huffman table. So probably we do not free the Huffman table. Let's see. <clears throat> um, is this this one? Yeah, we are parsing a Huffman table and we are never freeing the Huffman table. So it's clear that we are leaking. Let's see if we can fix at least this unit test from leaking. Mm, I made some mistake. Um, yeah, probably this. Memory as a mem is mem is not a pointer here. This is a structure to which we must take a pointer. <coughs> Really, what, what is this thing doing all these seconds before the first line shows up here? It's amazing. Yeah, so this, this leak is now fixed. So we have a pass on the test long prefixes and long prefixes tests here. We have only one test failing now that this the one that ha still has a leak. <clears throat> Very nice. Um, and what, what I can do now and what I will do off stream is to go through all my unit tests and at the end of every unit test add this check, are we leaking any memory? And if so, report what we are leaking. <clears throat> and it's nice. It is great. Um, we are seeing the beginnings of a very nice test infrastructure coming up here. I think that's a good point uh, to end today's session. So if you have any questions, drop them in the chat quickly. Um, Oh, not at all. Um, let me see if I ha did I have some notes for today uh, apart from this. Okay, we we edit. Uh, so we we edit we added some debug features to our allocator. This is partially done. Today we did not profile the allocator. We will still have enough time to do that. 
uh, we failed to find uh, the sources for the standard allocator. This is a bit annoying. Uh, we did most of this. Okay, so I think it was a productive session. Of course, what we what we did today in this memory debug functionality is still quite stupid. So we um, do a linear table search for blocks, which is of course slow. I mean, it's it's debug um, functionality, so um, it's not terrible. Uh, missing write and save code search. Yeah, um, I, I think over time, over time, we will um, have some interesting topics regarding how to write safe code. So currently my code is, is <clears throat> in, in prototyping and not particularly safe, but we will add a lot of debug functionality uh, for um, finding problems in the safety of our code. For example, like uh, overruns of, overruns of um, arrays on the heap or on the stack and we will do fast testing so we will pump invalid data into our functions our parsing functions especially and see if we can hit any problematic cases where we have some either leaking of memory or we will have overruns of memory buffers and so on and for the overruns I I want to add some for the debug, in the debug build, I want to add some uh, checking uh, by adding uh, Sentinel data before and after memory arrays. And we will, when the memory ar arrays are freed, we will actually check whether these Sentinel bytes have been overwritten or not. Um, so that will be interesting. Yeah, so I think uh, if you come back, there will be some there will be some stuff for you regarding um, checking robustness of and safety of code. Okay, thanks for watching. And I hope the, the video was markedly better this time with, with my improved bandwidth. I, I think I can still up the, the bit rate if, if there's still a problem. So I have some headroom left. I just noticed that that my CPU is actually already quite busy uh, doing the encoding, I think. So I maybe don't want to add too much additional bitrate. But yeah, that's it for today. Thanks for watching again and see you next time. Bye.